Okay, I'll turn it over to Eileen to introduce today's speaker. Stand up front here or something, right? To be visible. Okay, Stephen's <laughs> Well, it's my pleasure to, today to introduce Ari Martinez. I think many of you have met Ari in the few short months he's been around because he's become a very active member of the social community, social network here in the museum. But a little bit of formal background. <coughs> I'm joking. There's nothing to do with your background, Ari. No. <laughs> uh, Ari got his BA and his master's at UC Santa Barbara. And he did his PhD at the University of Florida with Scott Robinson. I'll come back to the period in between there in a minute. Uh, he's been an NSF postdoctoral fellow with our own Vance Friedenberg over at San Francisco State. And we have at least one San Francisco State infiltrator here today. Where'd you go, Tiffany? Yeah. <laughs> over from the Friedenberg lab. Uh, he then spent a short stint as a postdoc in China doing undisclosed things before joining the MVC <laughs> in August as a Chancellor's postdoctoral fellowship, so one of the, the special presidential fellows program that comes with this lifetime hiring incentive in the UC system, so a real plus for anyone holding those postdocs. Um, Ari's work, as you'll find out today, revolves around a number of themes related to birds, vocal communication and community structure, particularly neotropical habitats. He's the authority on this aspect of avian community structure, particularly in tropical bird systems. And as I think you'll see, he just likes birds and likes the tropics. So that brings me to the missing years. I won't give a number of years, but if you read Ari's CV, there's a conspicuous gap between finishing his master's degree and finishing his PhD, and even allowing for you know the normal field-based PhD, there is a little period in there. Uh, you mentioned the missing years that conjures up all kinds of thoughts in people's minds, right? Well, it turns out Ari was in the Peace Corps, where he served both in Nicaragua and Bolivia, and I think that's where some of his interest in the tropics was really sparked, or his conviction to then go on and get his PhD was really sparked. But it also combined a very strong interest in connecting with local people. As a native Spanish speaker, Ari has always been very engaged in the local communities and brings that to his practice here in the UC system as a mentor working with students. So the missing years were somewhere in, it was the tropical side of Nicaragua, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and Bolivia, I didn't even ask, the tropical lowlands or the highlands? Uh, lowlands. Yeah. Okay, so there's a theme here. I personally go to the other side of those countries, but you can, everyone teach their own. Um, other quick facts before I turn it over to Ari, because we now collect this fun fact from each speaker. Ari's fun fact is, I learned to make bread without an oven in the field. He doesn't indicate whether the bread actually grows or not, <laughs> or how successful that was. This thing's good when you're hungry. Yeah. <laughs> That's his fun fact. My fun fact is, I've noticed that Ari is on the frequent flyer program down at Micro Reality's. And so, uh, <laughs> coffee and bread, I think he's apparently covered in terms of dietary reasons. But I digress. I'm very pleased to welcome Ari today to tell us about his work to date involving avian communities in the neotropics. Thanks, Ari. Thank you, Eileen. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. It's uh, great to finally share my research with the larger MBC community. Um, I'm really not only excited to share my research with you because I think it's a fascinating uh, story, especially the, the natural history part of it, but I'm also excited because there's such a diversity of people here from the Museum of Urban Zoology, the larger school, um, the larger department in integrated biology, and then environmental science policy and management. It's just a prism uh, just a bunch of different perspectives on, on, on how to do uh, research on, in biology and um, in my particular interest in ecology. And so I'd love to get some of those perspectives from you in terms of other types of interesting things and angles to take uh, on some of the things I'm interested in. So uh, as my, uh, hopefully as my title conveys, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in understanding uh, and looking into how behavioral mechanisms might tell us something about community level process. And the main way I want to look at that is through the lens of thinking about social information. Now, social information comes in a lot of forms, and it's widespread throughout, uh, throughout um, a lot of biological systems. And obviously, it's very intuitive and obvious to, to just about anyone, right? If you're on the plains of Africa and you're a, you're a mammal, right, whether you're a gazelle or a zebra or you're, a, or you're an elephant, uh, you see everyone down uh, at a hole, 
and you might know that there's water there, and so you're taking advantage of other organisms to know something about where you might find a source of water, right? So it's a very obvious way to find a, a resource, and that's, the, and that's an inverted. Also, though, there's, there's more specific cues that animals can, can look into, and it can be in the form of attraction where you have, for instance, in Finland, you have different types of, of tits. You have blue tits, marsh tits, um, and uh, great tits. They are resident birds in the winter, and so when migrants come back, they'll actually cue into the call, uh, cue into the these presence of these species to, to, to evaluate something about ha uh, habitat quality, whether it's nesting success or food resources. And so there's this attraction that can happen between species that can influence species in space and time based upon the social information that if certain species can provide to other species. And that's um, the case of a positive benefit, right? And then there's also avoidance, right, where you have. Uh, least fly catchers, Rob Fletcher's work in Montana, actually showing playbacks of this competitively dominant species. Same thing, a migrant bird comes in, red starts, and migrants will actually, the red starts will actually <coughs> avoid areas where they hear the vocalizations, and so you're actually having a, a competitive dominant information driving the species away as it's trying to avoid its competitor. So you have these different scenarios where this inadvertent information takes a role, and of course there's mixed species groups, which are prominent just about everywhere, where again we go back to Africa and you have uh, Grants and um, Gramps and Thompson's gazelles, they'll, they'll feed together, but they have shared predators, right? So if one looks up, the other one can take advantage of that information in, a, in order to um, take the benefits of vigilance. Likewise, coral reef fish, if they can aggregate to similar food resources because they have shared resources in terms of food. And as we all know, anyone hopefully has been off the coast of California here, if you have school, schools of anchovies, you have everything from boobies to gannets to terns actually taking advantage of spotting each other and seeing if there's some kind of uh, area where they can get food. So you have this high concentration of species in space and time, and there's potential for interspecific complex communication to take, uh, take place and drive species interactions. But we're not going to talk too much about it being a complex inter, um, interspecific information. Most of the examples I've talked to you about is inadvertent information. So in the strict sense, information that's basically uh, being conveyed to, to a, a receiver, but uh, the inadvertent information means other species, other individuals that it's not intended for are picking up that information and using it, right? And what that's been come, come to be known as is eavesdropping, individuals that use information intended for another receiver. So incidentally, eavesdropping comes from the 17th century, where the eaves actually of a house, right, extended over the, the eaves of the roof, extended over the wall of the house, and that was called the eaves. And the water, would, when it rains, would drop off, and this would be the eavesdrop. And an eavesdropper, right, would be that person lurking outside the window underneath the eavesdrop to listen in on the information that was not intended for them inside the room. <laughs> so if anything else from this, from this talk, you have that in your back pocket, and you'll be the life of the party with that new, new tidbit, right? So of course, eavesdropping, right, has costs and benefits associated with it, right? And even in humanoids, right, if you're sneaking outside the room where Gandalf is talking to a hobbit and talking about the end of the world in the ring, well, you could be bumming because you're going to be sent on a life first king quest to get rid of that ring. So there's cost there, right? But I really want to talk in general, right, about the, I want to use a construct of, of, of information in terms of trade offs, right? And so Seppin has a paper from Ecology talking about how information could be a unifying theme in terms of space and time and, and from individuals relating to another up to level of communities. So if we think, I want to focus on distance as a metric of thinking about trade-offs, uh, because we're going to be talking about alarm information, which is instantaneous, so we won't think of the time aspect. And so we can think of, if you're, uh, if you're interested in listening for information, it's better to be near the source. That's where it's most valuable, right? And so as you get closer, this is where the information is most pertinent to you. Obviously, if you're a kilometer away from a bird that alarm calls, it's no value to you. If you're five meters away and you have a sure predator, it's very valuable. Conversely, though, everyone else is trying to do the same thing. So there's a, a cost of being really close, either with the, per, the individual giving the information, um, emitting that information, or the other individuals around it also getting, trying to get the information. So it can be a competitive cost. So we'd expect a trade-off, right, where the potential of information has to be greater than the cost of competition, right? And we'd expect this zone here to be where there's this net value of information, which would then be a measure of, of fitness and a benefit in terms of why you'd want to um, can glean information from another organism. So I'm going to use birds, as Eileen has mentioned, as a way of looking at this. And birds are really um, a great convenient way to look at um, some of these questions I'm going to be coming up with is because you can do all kinds of things with them, right? You can collect, you can catch them, 
You can get blood for looking at relationships between individuals. You can ban them, which is really important for me because then we can actually look at the behaviors in the field, right? And quantify what they do and where they go. And obviously a lot of this then we can record vocalizations of them, do the playback experiment, um, and then actually, and continue doing observations with them. So the remainder of my talk is going to be put into three parts. Uh, the first part is natural history about what is a flock and the flocks that I work with. And it's really fascinating natural history. And you have to be patient. It will take a, a good chunk of the talk, but it's a really complex system, but it's really neat. I, I have a feeling you'll enjoy it. And then I want to talk about assembly of species and flocks. So why are some species in flocks and not others? And then, so what are the consequences to, to being in a flock, of, of having certain species in it and not others? And then lastly, I want to go up and talk about the flock in the larger forest and how that might have consequences then about how that might be, uh, the reliance of information might influence the realized niche of the actual flock. So meet, uh, meet the flockers, right? Here's a flock. So the great thing about this system is that it's been described literally from every part of Amazonia. You might have different species, but it's the same system wherever you go. And what's been documented is basically you have this core group of species that are always in a flock. And you have these species here, which are, um, which are hypothesized actually flush insects, which this alarm calling bird will then benefit from, and vice versa, this bird will then uh, also gives alarm calls, which these species uh, typically eavesdrop and take advantage of. And it's very disproportionate. This, there's one species in this flock that pretty basically gives alarm calls. And to make the distinction here, a lot of people use alarm calls interchangeably with uh, mobbing. And so I, I, all of you know about mobbing, you hear chickadees going all over, chickadee dee dee, right? All these birds come in and they mob a crow or a hawk. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about alarm calls that are basically like, get out now and everyone dives or freezes. It's like evasive maneuvers, it's like an ambush. It's a warning call for ambush predators, which are typically raptors, okay? So, what's really cool about these guys is that you always have these three to 15 species always in a flock. We'll call them nuclear species to be anthropocentric, but anyhow, they're always there, okay? They're always present. And what's really interesting is that there's a pair of individuals of each of those species. It's not like you some of these cooperative breeding birds where you get 30 of one individual and five and 10 of another. They're just small groups of birds, maybe 10 birds, right? And they, what's really crazy is they share a territory year-round. That's not to say that the territory is the same, but if you look at their territories, they overlap because they're basically going around together. Um, so what you have then, for instance, here, if you look at this study from French Guiana, you have these polygons, which are basically these territories that are about six to eight, eight hectares uh, um, large in size. And for those of you who don't know, uh, metric that's about 12 acres. So um, yeah, uh, the, the, the highest. And so you have this group of species, right, that will be this core group of species, and they'll travel throughout their territory throughout the day, okay? And so you, in each, each place you go in the forest, you're basically on somebody's territory. In the Amazon, you walk anywhere, and you're, it, it, all the real estate's pretty much taken up. Someone, there's a flock everywhere, okay? But that's not all. What's really cool is that where you have this overlap of these territories, right, is basically where you, is, is, a, is a region where you ha have territory fights. Now just here, like here in the temperate region, you might have species, right, that will call in the breeding season, they'll, 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 they'll sing against each other to compete, to show that they have, they're on each other, to mark their territories, right? Well, in this case, what happens when a flock meets another flock, species A will line up and sing against species A, B will line up against species B, and C will line up against species C, and you literally can have all these species simultaneously singing and, and defending territories together. And it's great when you have field assistants out there and they're just like, what just happened? And it's really crazy to see, and it's really neat. So one of the things that um, I've mentioned is that they're stable, and you think, well, why can they be together? And one of those things, um, one of the reasons these different species can be together in this very stable group is the fact that you have, they have different ways of, of maneuvering uh, for, uh, for doing foraging maneuvers and, um, and feeding off different substrates. So, I, you know, I've, these are just different maneuvers, right? And these are different substrates. And so, and this is the proportion of use, I and mean, you can't see it, but basically the idea is if you look at each of these species, they have a different combination. This species mainly gleans, but it gleans off dead leaves. This species mainly gleans, but it gleans off live leaves. And this, this species sallies out into the air and feeds on green leaves. So they all kind of partition out how they forage, right? So this isn't, so the idea that they're together for foraging purposes isn't really, uh, uh, <coughs> A hypothesis that's, that's accepted. So the other cool thing is that you have, as they move throughout their territory, up to about 40 other species that join these flocks. Okay, so you have um, here, they come in, two species might come and go in the morning, 
another four might come and go sometime during the afternoon, and then late afternoon another one might come and go. Okay, so you have these species we'll call these facultative that come and join this core group of birds. All right, so then as this, as this goes throughout the territory, right, you have this, uh, this flock of birds that moves throughout its territory, and as it moves, these other species throughout the day come and leave, right? And so then what you get is, uh, if you look at time of day, like starting at the early morning, each of these is like a half, under, half hour interval of what's in a flock, starting sometimes six in the morning, maybe till uh, five in the afternoon. What you have, if you look at the number of species over the course of the day, right, it's that minimum group of five, that core species is always there, but then there's always somebody who comes and joins. These are means with 95% confidence intervals. This is averaged over a number of flocks, right? So if you go anywhere else in the Amazon, you'll see the same thing, basically. You'll have, even in different forest types, the inundated forest versus an upland forest, and other upland forests in other parts, you'll see basically this fluctuation. So you have this stable group that goes throughout its territory, and these other birds come and join um, throughout the day. So I mentioned, right, that these are really stable, right? And what I mean by stable is this isn't strictly in the Bob May sense of where if you perturb a community, right, how, how quickly does it come back or how much can you perturb it before it comes back to equilibrium. But there is some implications for thinking about those types of concepts, right? So I want to go to Narag in French Guiana where we did some work to actually, where we revisited a plot and I worked with Juan Pablo Gomez who was a, a, a collaborator of mine. And we basically went to this group of those, these territories I keep showing you, this was established in 1994, and we went and followed these same flocks around. One other thing I need to mention here is that these birds wake up in the same spot every morning. So they have a roosting site, and basically when you get, to the, when you, when you get there in the early morning, at 5 or 5.30, 6 in the morning, you'll have all these different species call within about 30 or 40 meters of each other, and then they'll start moving around together. So you have that, and then you have these territories. Well, we revisited this plot in 2011, and we, ba and we saw that you have the exact, the position of the, of the polygons, of the territories, of the home ranges, and the roosting sites were nearly identical after uh, 18, 17, 18 years. So what this says is really cool. What it says is these original birds were banded, so you have the characteristics of the flock outliving the individuals of the birds that are in the flock. Okay? And that is in terms of some of the characteristics of the flock there itself. But if we think in terms of Quantifying who's in it, what we usually do is some, a measure of what's called flocking occurrence. And what you do is sum up the number of flocks in which a certain species is present. So these core stable species, it's 100%. If you go to 10 flocks, there's going to be in 10 of them. Uh, and so if you do that across all the species, you can get a kind of a species abundance di uh, distribution in terms of percent occurrence of all these different species in the flock. And if you compare 1994 to 2011, where you have these these core species, they're, all, they're almost all identical. So you have very stable structure in terms of space and time of what these things do. So it makes it really fun to work with. And with that in mind, you have these replicate units, right? But there's the assembly. I want to get now into this idea of looking at some of these ideas of this trade-off, right? The assembly of species in these flocks. And uh, why are some species in flocks, not, not others, right? And got to have your token slide of all the diversity of birds. But it's a good way of saying that they vary in a lot of different kinds of functional traits. So they they vary in the way they forage. So I talked about it a little bit just with the core species, but they forage very differently. Uh, they ha have at different heights in the forest. They're different body sizes. So there's uh, lots of different types of functional traits that might explain why they're in a flock. And I'm thinking of this in terms of relying on heterospecific information. I like doing experiments. And one of the things we could do is go to French Guiana and ask why some, um, sorry, go back. These are my collaborators, don't want to jump ahead. Uh, these, uh, Juan Pablo Gomez was also in the previous study, and then Jose Miguel Ponciano and Scott Robinson from University of Florida. And so we can ask then, looking at some of these functional traits, how do these different things influence whether you rely on hydrospecific information in the terms of alarm calls? So we talked about distance from the alarm source might be a, might be a, a way of, an indicator of how well you respond to an alarm call. So we measured, that's one of the things we're going to measure, we measure body size of these different birds, the degree of sociality, well, do they respond more if they're in a flock or not, their foraging height, and foraging strategy, which is a much more super, superficial metric than what I, should, I talked to you about before, and then control for phylo phylogeny. So we had some predictions about how these traits might influence how species respond to alarm calls. And what we did is we predicted that if you're close to an alarm source, you're more likely to respond and far away, right? Smaller species that are around the same size as the alarm caller 
are going to be having more of a shared predator, so they would expect these guys to respond more. Species in open areas or in little microhabitat would be more likely to respond than those in dense cover. Uh, birds that search these near substrates, this is the foraging strategy, uh, are more likely to respond to alarm calls than birds that search far away. In other words, if you're gleaning off a leaf, you're not looking at the, uh, the environment around you. If you're a fly-catching bird, that is a bird that sallies out and catches insects. You're looking out around, and so you're actually doubling up on the cost of feeding while looking for predators. And then birds that forage higher in the forest might be more vulnerable because they're not near the forest floor. So what we did is we, we went throughout the forest, we recorded alarm calls of this, this that alarm calling bird in that flock, and then we played back these alarm calls to all these different birds of the forest. We played back, uh, we had around 300 trials, about 50-50 in terms of alarm trials and controls, and we me measured those different metrics that I mentioned before in terms of explaining response to alarm calls. So to give you an idea of what it looks like, here's the bird. This is my wonderful National Geographic quality yeah. video, right? So anyway, there's the bird. This is an ant wren. This is one of those core members in a flock. And so right? So it dives down really quickly, right? And some people um, have said to me, well, it could just be that they get scared of anything. Well, that's why you have a control. And even if you play other types of really loud sounds, they don't do that, right? And so they, you play this, and, and it's a really strong response a lot of times, right? Um, sorry. Uh, so, okay. So foraging strategy is the spoiler. This is the one that makes sense of all the variables we talked about. And so this is probably responding to the alarm call. Um, this isn't um, back transformed, which is why it exceeds one. And what you have are these different foraging strategies that uh, the variation in this basically tells you the probability of responding to alarm calls. And so what you see is these birds that glean and bark off and, and bark glean, birds that feed closely off of the surfaces of substrates, are the ones that respond really strongly to alarm calls. Uh, and these fly-catching birds and ground foragers and these birds that pounce through the ground are, uh, don't respond much at all. And so you have, this as being a really strong predictor of, of, what, res of what responds to alarm calls and therefore a measure of predation risk. One of the things to notice is that, well, we didn't have uh, an effect of distance. We measured playbacks from about 10 to 20 meters, and we didn't see much of an effect. So we, we, there must be a step function farther away than 20 meters or where it drops off and that information is no longer of use. So what we can say then is that if you look um, in terms of the value of information, one of the things that uh, we can consider then is that the, the trait of how you forage might influence how valuable that information is. So, this line might not be different from how we, how we tested distance, but we can see that there is a distinction in terms of what, you might, what might rely on information more in terms of one species than another based upon the foraging strategy. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is, I, I, is, is what are the consequences of certain species being in flocks and not others. And so for that, I want to um, uh, go to, oh, I should also mention, sorry, uh, no phylogenetic signal. Sorry, I'm busy. But anyway, so um, um, so we're going to go to southeastern Peru um, for another study where these flocks do something that's even cooler, I think. And so this is southeastern Peru, and I'll explain more about these, but all these little polygons, all these blobs are different territories, and they're about three to four hectares of these different flocks. And so we were in hammocks in French Guiana, now we're in tents, and it's really pretty. That's the bottom one, okay? So... What are the consequences of being in here? So what I want to show you here was really cool. I talked about these different core species and one of them being an alarm caller. At this site, what's really cool is that these species actually, you get flocks with one or, or another of, an alarm, of these different alarm callers in the same genus, right? So you have these two species of ant shrikes living in sympatry, but they're in different flocks. And they have alarm call structures that are a little different. This is a frequency versus time to show you the, it's called a sonogram, which shows you the structure of the alarm call. And you can see there are a lot of stuttery notes over about a second of time because it has to be a, a really quick uh, piece of information to give out. And so that is also what I played back before, a similar type of structure. Okay. So here what you have then is you have in the forest, anywhere again, you have the forest is saturated with these different flocks. And you, what, I want is, what, you see, what I want to point out here is that the ones, the, the, the numbers in blue, are the flocks that have this alarm calling bird, and the flocks with the, the red numbers are the ones that have this, 
this alarm collar. So they're in the same genus, okay? And what's interesting though is that if you look at the species composition of these different flocks, they're basically the same, apart from the alarm calling verb, which are obviously in different flocks. But everything else, if you do a break Curtis analysis and you look at the species similarity, they're pretty much identical. So what we want to do is test then the, how information might vary about, in terms of information or quality of information about alarm calling. And so what we did is we, we teamed up with a falconer and we had three different raptors and we basically played these raptors, we exposed these different predators to these flying raptors to see whether they varied in the information they provided in terms of their detectability and also in the information they encoded. And so we, we did a Home Depot version of a parab parabolic mic for recording the responses and then this is one of our falconers and it, our, collab our collaborator who owned the business who uh, Coca Raptors is Luis Fernando Collado and then here's some of my collaborators Eliseo Para, who is also a graduate student at New San Francisco State that I'm co-advising with Vance Friedenberg. And basically, I want to test whether obviously variation is the same between these, uh, variation, if there's variation between the two alarm callers, uh, or if there's differences in whether they have the ability, or their differences in tech predators. And then secondly, whether they encode information. So we have three raptors. Two of them are, are the same size, yet these are they're three different species. So if we see that they have different responses to these three different individuals, then it would suggest that they actually distinguish between different predator types. If they respond similar to these two predators, even though they're different, uh, composed of this one, would say something that they distinguish about basically size. Okay? And then the last thing is, are there, is there a difference in terms of what they encode in terms of context of threat, in terms of distance? <clears throat> and so to do that, we, basically, we throw these, uh, like, throw these um, raptors at these different flocks, Right, and here's an example. We have here have a person recording. We have a person um, uh, observing the alarm calling bird, and then you have the, the falcon. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, let's do that. Go. Looking straight ahead. Exposed. 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 And you can hear right there out the alarm calling bird. Yeah. And then that's the. Mm -hmm. And then that's. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And then that's the. Uh, and that's the raptor begging for food. These guys don't hunt. They've never hunted in real life, so they don't actually go after the birds, just so you know. They, so once they're done, they're like calling for food, giving my, you know. They're like, where's my pay? So here is, uh, so we had three raptors. That was the Harris hawk. We have here an occipiter. And then we have here, we have an Appalachian falcon. So it's also important to point out that this is the only native predator. This is actual, this bird's native to the forest. But if we see that they respond similar to these two, then it would suggest that they're not really worried about the actual species, but more about just the body size and the shape, right? And that makes sense because a lot of times these guys will give alarm calls to pigeons or whip creepers or anything that kind of flies through. They're, they're, they're jittery birds. Okay, so if we go throughout this forest, then what we did is we go to each of these flocks and we play three different predator. Uh, we, we fly these three pre different predators at three different distances to the alarm calling bird. And we have a control, so it's essentially we have a semi-factorial design where we, base, where we have about 10 trials per flock. Okay, and we rotated and ran, randomized how we did that. So I'm going to show you some of the um, results, which are a little, um, uh, there's a lot here. I, what, this is, these are the predictions based on the, the, the linear mix models. And what I, base, I, what I want you to concentrate on are the lines, which are the model predictions and the points of predictions too, but the lines will tell you the story. So right here, you have the, the model predictions for what we saw of a response in terms of these two smaller raptors versus the larger one, uh, which is here, right? And we see that there is some separation, but not much here. And then for the other species, we see the same thing. We see some separation between the two smaller raptors versus the larger one. And then these, this down here is the control. And of course, what should also be obvious is that this species detects predators a lot more than this one, or at least produces alarm players, calls, calls a lot more. Okay. So it gets a little sloppier for looking at, this is for the probability of responding to an alarm call. But we also have the number of urgent notes, which isn't as strong a pattern. It's the same kind of thing, but you see there's more urgent notes for these smaller birds versus this larger raptor. And again, there's not much distinction here between the two, but they're, they're about three to five notes, double the notes versus the, the smaller raptor. Okay? So there seems to be some information encoded about a, a predator type, not much for distance. And then there's definitely this variation between these two birds. Okay? So, there seems to be variation in the landscape in terms of, of, of information in this, in this landscape where predation risk is a real, pro, uh, a real risk for a lot of birds. 
So I think this is really interesting because this story basically tells you that, well, if you have these two different flock types, everyone else is the same, and yet the information varies. It says real estate's really different depending on who you are and what flock. Okay? And the, the question then is, well, how do these birds respond to these different alarm calls? So we also have a co-advising a, a master's student with uh, Matteo Grigio from Italy, and we actually used these alarm calls and played them back to the birds because we want to actually know with these other eavesdropping birds that are these poor species, how well do they respond to these alarm calls? Do they value these alarm calls? Do they value these alarm calls differently? And what I want to show you here is a com combined response of these two eavesdropping species. These are poor species in the flock. And which, what I want you to focus on is the fact that there is a difference in terms of how well they respond to one alarm caller versus the other. Okay? And so there seems to be a lot of variation in that information. And so not only can uh, the functional traits of, of, of species in terms of their reliance on information tell you something about this trade-off of, of the net value information, but who's giving the information also can, can, can be an influence in terms of shaping the trade-off and where you might want to be. So might might be suggestive of, of if you're with this bird and you're more valuable in terms of an alarm call, are you willing to, is there more competitive aggression to be around that bird? So again, this is really cool, I think, because here you have, if you looked at beta diversity of these flocks and you do a Bray Curtis analysis and you use the flock as a metric of community, communities, you basically see there's zero turnover. But with one or two uh, species of variation in there, you can have really big consequences for everyone else in the group. Okay, so I've talked about assembly of, of natural history. I've talked about the assembly of these species in these flocks, uh, some of the consequence of, of why some species and not others, and then what are the consequences. And then I want to start talking about a little bit about flock and larger forest and how does this, so how, what does this mean for the realized niche of a flock? <clears throat> okay, uh, so if we step back about 30 years ago, um, Lima and Dill had this really seminal paper about uh, predator-prey interactions and how behaviors can really, behavioral decisions based upon assessing predation risk in the landscape can really influence species distributions in space and time. And we know this, right? We all know a ton of examples. Everyone knows a classic example, I would think, of, of elk in Yellowstone, right? Where the elk, once the, uh, where the wolves were reintroduced, they shifted their positions of where they were in Yellowstone, right? Similarly, um, water striders on a much smaller scale in streams, Scott Cooper's work, uh, showed that in the presence of trout, the water striders on the ponds will actually move to the edges of these streams. And then lastly, of course, we have kelp forests off the coast of California, where Fish, uh, fish will actually take refuge in these to avoid predators, and so you have different types of distributions of these species in space to, uh, in time based upon evaluating predation risk. But what's also very common, what really hasn't been, Oliver Mueller Klein is a student here, sorry, he's a student at, um, of Wayne, uh, Wayne um, Getz, and he actually went to the field with me and he actually collaborated with me along with um, Alessio Opada and Vance Greenberg on this, on this work. And so the thing I want to mention here is that eavesdropping is widespread, uh, and that's something that hasn't been factored into this equation of how species evaluate predation risk in the landscape. In other words, we know a lot of studies where, where, where species evaluate predation risk on their own, but do they take advantage of other species to um, modify how they decide to occupy space? So one of the things we can think of is this flock, base, this flock form is, is, is an understory flock in the rainforest, and so if we think of a resource gradient of where this flock is, they rely a lot on these alarm calling birds for information. Incidentally, all those, the, a lot of the birds that respond to those alarm calls, uniformly all the ones that are those core group of species uh, are, are, are species that respond very strongly to alarm calls. And these birds have a certain part of the forest and it's been hypothesized that they inhabit a certain part of the forest because this alarm calling bird allows, it to, allows them to take advantage of a part of the forest that would be otherwise too risky, right? This, or these opener parts of the forest. And that without this, without this bird, you might expect that there might be this shift in where these species go in terms of this realized niche. So we made some predictions on that, where on that hypothesis, where we'd expect that first of all, if that information is not there based upon that trade-off, it might not be, no, it might not longer uh, be worth the trade-off to be in the flock. So you might see less species in the flock itself. We also uh, made a prediction that other other uh, flocking species will use areas with higher vegetation cover once you remove this alarm calling bird. And then also that uh, you can, this might lead to the altered home range behavior of the flock itself as it's adjusting and trying to find a good place to go. And so we're going to stay in this, in this field site and we're actually going to look at um, 
eight different flocks. This is in that same field site, and we basically assigned eight of these flocks to controls or removals for each. Not huge sample sizes, but it's on the scale of three to four hectares. That's what we can do. And what I'm going to show you then is we basically we followed these flocks through time, and I told you about flocking occurrence is the percentage of time that a species is in a flock. And so what you're going to do is look at the percentage of species in the flock from the pre-removal to the post-removal period, right? So we followed these flocks for three days with the alarm calling bird in the flock. We, we monitored where they were, we monitored who was in them, then we removed the alarm calling bird, and then for three days saw who was in the flock for the next three days and where they were and what they did. Okay, so what you get then is a percent of time for each of the species that are these core species. These are just core species, don't worry about the, the, the four letter abbreviations. And what you need to know is that so each, each of these species has a percentage of time it's in the flock. And once you remove, when you're going to compare that pre removal period to the percentage of time that the birds are in the flock after the removal. And that's going to be a net change. So the net change in flocking occurrence, if it's, if it's above the red line, says that there's an increase in the time that these species spend in the, top, in the flock. And a decrease in flocking occurrence says that there's, they're spending less time in the flock. Right? And so these are predictions, uh, model predictions, uh, mean and 95% confidence intervals. And what you see is the net change in flocking uh, occurrence is mainly a trend. It's, it's not significant for most of these species. They tend to decrease more, but there's a couple that definitely uh, do drop out a lot or, or that aren't in the flock as much. And then a couple don't change at all. But what's also interesting about this is you might see some change but overall, the flock still holds. And I think it's also suggested that while it does affect some species, it says there's other benefits of being in a group, right? Which is the classic idea of maybe the dilution effect. So this alarm calling bird isn't around, but it's better that we still hang out together because one of us is better than you might get eaten versus me, right? So there's, there's a reason for doing that. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is looking at vegetation. So we followed these flocks around, and then what we did is we did a very cursory uh, measure of, of vegetation occupancy at different height profiles of the forest. And so we just walked around and said, is vegetation present from 0 to 1 meter? Is vegetation present from 1 to 2 meters, 2 to 4 meters, 4 to 8 meters, and 8 to 16? Because as you look higher and higher, you're, there's variance in what you estimate. And so what we did then is summarize the percent of, of hits at 0 to 1 to get percent <laughs> occupancy of vegetation at each of these different height intervals. And then we could compare that with in, during the pre to the post to see if there's a change in the <coughs> amount of vegetation at each of these different height intervals. Okay? So we're going to see here is that this, uh, if you're at the left of this line, there's a percent change, a negative percent change in the amount of vegetation at that height. Um, that means it's less dense. And if it's positive, it means it's denser at these heights. Okay? And so the black dots are the controls, and then the, the gray dots are the removals. And what you see is essentially you see a separation of these two where it's actually more open in the post. But there is a separation in terms of overall, there's more, it's more dense in the forest where these birds are after you remove uh, the alarm calling bird. And so lastly, we, we uh, took GPS points of these flocks and looked at their home range. And what we show is here is that we've got the blue, the, the red being the post and the blue being the pre. So we followed them around and we're looking at the percentage of overlap. How much from the time that we um, followed these birds with the alarm calling bird to the time that we removed it, how much of those two areas overlap. And so this is for uh, the control. This is an example of the control flock, of a control flock. And here's an example of removal. So they shift where they go, right? And so all these things together, we think, suggest that, in fact, there is, a, there is some evidence for this idea that removing this bird that provides information actually affects the a realized niche of these other species and where they can be in the forest. So uh, in conclusion, I hope to show that there's, these flocks are very stable in space and time. And I think it's really interesting and a really good system to ask a lot of questions. And so that there's variation also in the traits of eavesdroppers in terms of who makes up the flock, right, based upon this trade-off and specifically on foraging uh, strategy. There's also variation in alarm calling, uh, alarm calling, which can influence the fitness of the flock members. So whoever is, depending on who's in the flock, might very well influence the fitness of the flock members in terms of um, who's in the flock as far as an alarm caller. And then eavesdropping, uh, birds that are relying on, on, on other species for information uh, might realize that, uh, might have their uh, realized niche influenced by species that provide information. So with that said, I just want to talk really quickly about some future directions. Uh, I, now, I like the slide because I like the rain. It's not because it's ominous, but <laughs> rain's awesome. And uh, so 
I've also developed, um, along with some collaborators from, uh, that worked at STRI, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute of Panama, looking at a parallel line of work in terms of foraging benefits. There's ant following birds, right? There's ant following birds that swarm along, it's a classic phenomenon in under the neotropical rainforest, where ant, ants, army ants and the genus Eseton swarm throughout the forest. They flush all these insects, and these birds jockey for position to get these different insects. So there's certain birds that are obligates, and we looked at the different types of cues in terms of vocal cues that other birds might use in order to uh, be attracted to, to these flocks. And we are also looking at it on, on Barrel, Colorado Island, where one of these flock members has dropped out to look at some of the behaviors, whether it's innate or whether it's learned. And so also, uh, I want to look at the long-term effects of information reliance. I'd like to do a longer-term experiment in terms of what happens when you remove these, these species and uh, look at the role of sociality in, 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 in eventually in food webs. I uh, want to start looking at metabarcoding in terms of the diets of these birds, both in terms of how uh, their niche shifts, their uh, diets might uh, shift in the absence of the alarm calling bird, but also thinking in terms of this, this social group of birds and how it influences the food web. So that's a uh, one line of research. And then also looking at the evolution of multi species sociality with China, with um, Evan Goodale in China. Uh, we want to uh, look at, there's multiple flock systems throughout the world that people have studied, so we'd actually start looking at evolutionary relationships amongst birds with different traits to see how multi species uh, uh, sociality might have come about. And the interesting thing about multi species sociality, in terms, especially with birds, is that a lot of work hasn't been, doesn't seem to really be based really strongly in a lot of the work in terms of monospecific groups and why monospecific groups form and the benefits of that. And so being here at MBZ, um, with Eileen's group and Damien's group, um, um, hopefully will help develop that further. And then I'd also like to look at the relative contribution of different species to eavesdropping information networks. And that means basically looking at these different birds and the for different animals in the forest. Well, we got primates, a uh, little tamarin, and we have different types of birds uh, that are, some of these are colonial, um, are colonial um, monospecific colonies of birds. Others are cooperative breeders and they uh, inhabit different parts of the forest. They all have alarm signals, and it'd be really interesting to start testing the relative contribution of these alarm callers to generating e to, to the eavesdropping networks and providing information to other species in the forest. And Alice Apata, who's uh, the graduate student who's finishing, is actually starting to do some of this with looking at social network analysis with some of the data we have from this past summer. And with that, uh, obviously, as most of you know, there's, it takes a lot of time to do field work, and they have a ton of field assistance. Um, and they've all worked super hard, and um, it's, it's obviously everyone's excited when they go down. A lot of times there's some days when people aren't very excited, but I'd like to think, I mean, all of them, even after asking for a letter, they still say they enjoyed it after asking for a letter of recommendation, and a lot of them have gone on to grad school, so I'd like to think that they've benefited as well. And I'd also like to thank my funders, uh, which is CNRS, uh, Chancellor's Postdoctoral Program, Nat Geo, and then NSF, and then, um, these are the names of all the people involved. And also want to mention uh, Pante Koy Lodge and some of the people who helped out with the logistics, Willie Irpin and um, Willie Nanis in Peru. And then all my collaborators uh, that have helped me along the way and have taught me some amazing things and given me new perspectives and insights and hopefully we we'll continue working on in the future. And with that, wave your part. Oh, actually, that was actually showing a shift in the vegetation of where the flock is. Yeah, so. so then how, how do you, so have you, for that one, did you do like you remove the uh, whole species, but you still play the alarm call? And you just follow them around. So. Yeah. You know, I'm just wondering if, if there is anything else than just a lot call, but how the realized niche may have changed after you remove the species uh -huh. could, could resolve the shift in um, the future. Yeah, I don't, um, I, certainly, there, there, there's a lot of ways it can happen, but I just, I think that, I mean, it was pretty obvious when we did it, when we took that bird out, these things started doing a lot of erratic different things. Um, so from an anecdotal point of view, it just seemed like that was a real, uh, a real driver. Um, but certainly there's other things in other ways that you realize niche could be. I can't give you a really satisfactory answer on that, but it's really possible. Yeah. yeah. So these mixed flock species are really, um, classic and interesting, yeah. and um, all the alarm calls are public information. I'm not sure if it's really eavesdropping in the same sense as sitting outside that private conversation in the room, mm -hmm. but um, 
because of that, you're also treating it as an honest signal. And early studies in this right. system by Charlie Munn right. said, well, maybe the signal isn't so honest and that these alarm callers are crying wolf. Right. Uh, are you still <coughs> finding that as a possibility? Or is yeah, see, that's the problem is that I, I haven't. Um, it's, it's, it's so, it was a be it's a beautiful story, um, and that's why I actually put when, on that slide about mixed species groups the potential for complex interspecific communication. Because in that sense, if it is a collective parasite, if it is, then there's an intention of giving that information to these other species. So they were calling, so, and but, then everybody would duck, and then, yeah, the, and then the caller would forage more. Right, right, were, right, right. So the, the idea being idea. that, right, that this alarm calling bird would alarm call, and then be, with these other birds, they would scare these other birds, they'd drop the insects, and they'd steal it. And that was the story. But I, I haven't ever actually seen that myself. And if you actually look at that original paper, it doesn't actually quantify um, the amount of time, the actual uh, items caught, for instance. But the other thing is, is that I've, everyone else I've talked to, everyone asks, have you ever seen that? And, and no one has seemed to have seen it. What I have seen is that the birds actually do, excuse me, they do, when you see these, uh, they do steal food from these other birds. I mean, they're super acrobatic. And when you see these other birds dropping food items, they race down and get it. But I haven't seen them do that and alarm call at the same time. So it's been very hard to see that, actually. But it might be. Yeah. Andy, yeah. Um, how does mating work between flocks? Like, does, do, does a flock find another flock and all the, they all pair up No, together? so the individuals, <laughs> yeah, right. So the end of and, and maybe a second part, too. Yeah. Do um, progeny inherit the flock of their parents? Yeah. Like, are they kind of co- Yeah, that's kind of the million dollar question. So mm -hmm. there's some evidence that, that they disperse and no one's um, actually been able to show that. We've started taking blood samples um, to actually try to look at some of the relationships between individuals in these different flocks. Um, but clear what there's, there's, um, so the birds most likely disperse out, but they, uh, in, in terms of there are a lot of floaters out there. And what we saw when we removed, when we removed these, uh, the, these alarm climb birds for three days, almost immediately, like within 24 to 40 hours, another bird would come in immediately. And it seemed like it would have been from the neighboring flock, one of that maybe an offspring, that would come in just, just new, right away. And we had to do playbacks for the, it there and in the controls. And we had to do playbacks to scare them out you know, for the, in the morning, and by the third day it started getting really hard. But, but the point being is I think they're, they're just always conscious of something that's around. And so I have a few, my, my intuition is that they are probably, there's probably a lot of flocks that, that are neighboring where there's birds that are related. But that's just my intuition. But hopefully with some of the blood work we can figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So for the realizing it initially, it, they shifted in space, not just expanded, right? Right. Um, so what are the different, like, do you, I don't know, uh, do you have any idea of what the difference between the two niches are? Whether the, Well, it's um, just, it's just, from being out, it's denser. It, it, it's crappier to follow them. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty, I, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that's ridiculous. It would have been really nice to have showed you a picture and you went, well, wow. And I just, because you're going through and you're trying to get the experiment done and I just didn't take any pictures and I really regret it because you could see some really big differences where you followed through in one part of its territory and another part where it would kind of hang out, you remove this bird and then it'd just be this, it'd be in a really, like one example, just an extreme, like a gap, a, a, you know, an area that was just really dense underneath. And then, um, and so, yeah, I would have liked to have captured that, but it just seems to be really dense and uh, viney. Capture efficiency or something important. Well, I just think maybe cover. I don't know. But, yeah. Sir, yeah, in the back corner. Sorry. Uh, so you have this very stable flock structure that seems to span uh, time with someone like the uh, time of like decades. Yeah. Um, but have you ever seen an instance where a new flock formed? And going by, would your hypothesis be, or what I get from your talk would be, that an alarm call bird would have to seed that area first, and then these other birds would just do you have any idea about like the inception of flocks or how flocks come to be? Just uh, no, um, I, I, it, yeah, I don't have an idea of that. Again, I can say in another example when we removed, um, when we did this removal, in, in one instance it seemed like these other birds started encroaching in on that territory. So it's either, uh, yeah, I would expect that yeah, those birds would seed it really quickly, either, either seed it really quickly or it would be swallowed up by two or three other flocks. Those are my, my two main hypotheses about how they form, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Is that Evan? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, after you removed the 
a long collar? Did you put them back? And if so, what happened after? Yeah, right. So, um, <coughs> we f I had um, people begrudgingly follow them around for a day after we put them back, most of them. Um, and so, uh, in three cases, yeah, um, they seemed to resume where they were going. Uh, and in the fourth case, um, we lost the male. And when we released the female, it left, and that flock, it, those, the, some of the other birds are still there, but they're kind of with another bird in another part of the world. It was kind of edgy territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, in the graphing plot, a differential response of yeah. different far different types to alarm calls. Yeah. You have, for example, the four brown tweeners. We're responding a lot less to the calls than, yeah. for example, the tweeners. I was wondering to what extent you think perhaps you might have observed that maybe it's not that they weren't responding, but rather that given that the predator was an aerial predator, it was most advantageous for them to come sit tight if they were foraging. Um, yeah, uh, so well, we measured before and after the response. So we, we actually you, you, we, we observed the birds for about 10 to 20 seconds as a pre, and then we have we have and then we have 10 to 20 seconds of post, so we can see a change in the behavior. And we didn't really see any change in the behaviors, and um, so that's why we're saying that they're really just not paying attention. Yeah. I mean, and, and they're all exposed to it, right, because these territories saturate the forest, so whether you're in a flock or not, you're exposed to this information. Yeah, yeah. does that answer the question? Or not really? Yeah, um, yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, if you're sitting on the ground foraging, and hear a call that there's an aerial predator, the worst thing you could possibly do is flight into the shrubs. But oh, if I you see, see no saying. response whatsoever, right, but you would, then Yeah, right. So in that case, it would be freezing, right? Because yeah. I showed you the most extreme example, but in a lot of yeah. cases, they're murdered and they just freeze. Yeah. So that would have been the response if we'd seen that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's about that time. I just want to, you know, a lot of people in this room do field work, but think about how tough it is to pull off those experiments, right, and actually get meaningful data, so I think that's impressive. Thanks, Ari. <laughs>